Imagine commuting to work on a rocket-powered space plane and carrying out your job in the microgravity environment of low Earth orbit. Except now, you don't have to be a NASA astronaut flying a space shuttle to the ISS. That was the past. In the future, all industries will have access to a multi-use business park in the sky, an orbital platform where new products and ideas can be tested and developed in the most unique circumstances, where artists can push their creativity across new horizons, and where a very fortunate few will visit just for the opportunity to catch a first-hand glimpse of the cosmos. In the future, we will have the Orbital Reef. This is the Space Race. The Orbital Reef is the best standing idea we have on how we're going to succeed the International Space Station, a platform that is nearing 25 years since the first module was deployed into orbit. That's already five years past the station's best before date, and it's really showing the age, especially compared to a modern space station like China's Tiangong. It's a pretty striking difference. Then there's the minor complication that half of the international station is owned and operated by the Russian government. The ISS is a relic of a bygone era, and it's long past time we move on. The orbital reef could be where we take our next step as humankind. This is a concept for a privately operated space station, so no governments, no nations, just pure capitalism. What could possibly go wrong? For real though, the past decade has shown us that private operators in the aerospace field can innovate with disruptive technology, and they can reliably get the job done when it comes to putting stuff into space. The primary companies behind Orbital Reef are Blue Origin and Sierra Space. These companies are not exactly new, but relative to the sitting aerospace vanguard, they are of a newer generation, and admittedly, neither have established much of a track record. Sierra has constructed a few prototype space habitats, and they've run low-altitude glide and landing tests of their Dream Chaser space plane. Blue Origin has sent a few handfuls of people, mostly rich folks like the unfortunate founder Mr. Bezos, on brief rocket rides to the Carmen line and back again. Fortunately, those two have enlisted support from a legacy aerospace company in Boeing. They have a significant track record in spaceflight. Though, admittedly, they've been kinda hit and miss, more recently racking up a few more misses, but they did build the SLS core module, and it did get to orbit, eventually. The concept for Orbital Reef is to begin operation as early as 2027. Now, that likely won't happen, but this is a prospective timeline as it stands right now. No one ever meets their deadlines when it comes to new developments in spaceflight, that's just the way it is. The core modules of the Orbital Reef will be deployed by the Blue Origin New Glenn rocket. From the renderings that we've seen so far, it looks like three large modules that make up the spine of the station. These are taking full advantage of the 7 meter diameter fairing of the New Glenn, which will be one of the widest rockets in operation. They haven't actually built the New Glenn yet, but they do have a full scale model of the rocket that they've been using for testing and other things like that. And the BE-4 launch engine has actually completed development. The first few production models are on their way to United Launch Alliance to be installed on the new Vulcan rocket, which might even launch sometime this year. The heavy lift New Glenn is scheduled for its own maiden voyage as early as 2024. Again, that likely won't happen, but this is a prospective timeline as it stands right now. Sierra Space is going to be responsible for the inflatable habitat modules of Orbital Reef. Those are the balloon-looking things sticking out from the side. Inflatable space habs have actually been a very long-standing concept. The field used to be led by a company called Bigelow Aerospace, but they kind of fizzled out and collapsed very rapidly a few years ago. Their founder got obsessed with paranormal phenomenon and the afterlife, kind of lost his mind, but that's a whole other video. Sierra Space has been working on prototypes of their inflatable modules, including a series of small-scale pressure tests beginning in late 2022 and continuing through today that have pushed the HAB to as much as 204 PSI, which goes well above the safety requirements for low Earth orbit operations. Additionally, Sierra are contributing their Dream Chaser space plane to the operation. This will serve as the primary vehicle for bringing supplies and passengers to the orbital reef. 
Just like the old space shuttle, the Dream Chaser will re-enter the atmosphere and glide down for a runway landing, making it fully reusable. The space plane can transport up to 12 people or 5,500 kilograms of cargo to low Earth orbit. A full-scale working prototype of Dream Chaser has been constructed. It's named Tenacity. Sierra has conducted flight tests where they dropped Tenacity from a helicopter and then glided down for a runway landing. That was back in 2017. Right now, the vehicle is being fitted with heat shield tiles for its first orbital launch, which is scheduled to happen as early as this summer, and the company is hoping to have Dream Chaser crew rated by 2026. I don't need to say the thing about timelines again, do I? I think you all get the point. Now, let's just say for the sake of optimism and good faith that all of that stuff we just talked about actually goes according to plan. It could happen. Now, what could it be like to visit the orbital reef? What would you find up there? Well, the first step is going to be blasting off in the Dream Chaser. The plane is going to launch on top of the ULA Vulcan rocket booster that we mentioned earlier. ULA will be using a launch pad at Cape Canaveral, Florida, and the Dream Chaser is going to be carried into orbit by the Centaur upper stage. We've already seen a couple of different renderings for how this might look, both with the space plane exposed at the tip of the rocket and with it tucked away under cargo fairings. Obviously, it would be a much cooler ride if you could see through the windows the whole time, so here's hoping for that configuration. As the space plane breaks through Earth's atmosphere, there is going to be a jolt when the main engines cut off and the booster core separates. Unfortunately, the Vulcan is going to plummet helplessly back down to the Earth and become more space garbage at the bottom of the ocean. Then, the Centaur upper stage is going to kick in and give the plane a second push up to its orbital velocity, reaching a height of around 250 miles above the Earth's surface. From there, the Vortex engine onboard Dream Chaser will navigate to a rendezvous with Orbital Reef. The Dream Chaser will dock up with an airlock at the end of the core module and connect through a port in the plane's tail section. Entering the station, the first thing that's going to stand out is just how big it is on the inside. The largest modules of the ISS are 4.3 meters in diameter. The core module of the Tiangong is about the same even though it looks much wider because it's so much less cluttered. The orbital reef core is going to be 6.2 meters in diameter. It is humongous and exceptionally well lit. Instead of those little portholes on the ISS, the reef has full length windows running down both sides of the core. The view is going to be overwhelming. Moving through the station, we'll find that the inflatable HAB modules are even more spacious. These will be 27 feet long by 27 feet tall with an internal volume of 300 cubic meters. The basic floor plan for each inflatable HAB is to contain three individual levels, each with plenty of headroom to freely float around. There's a ladder that goes up through the middle to connect them all. There are no windows in these modules, but there is a docking port at the end to connect an array of sensors and instruments, or a telescope, or maybe even a 360 degree cupola window that a person could go inside and experience free floating in space. The idea with these inflatable HABs is that they can be configured in any way that they are needed. You could have a hydroponic garden on the top level, a gym in the middle, and a crew quarters on the bottom. Or the whole thing could be an artist studio where painters and sculptors experiment with the effect of zero gravity on their medium. One HAB could be a factory in space that takes advantage of zero-G manufacturing to 3D print revolutionary fiber optics. There could be an entire film production studio in one hab shooting movie scenes and TV shows. Maybe YouTubers even make it to space. I could see Mr. Beast going up there and filming a video called 10 Ordinary People Go to Space for the First Time, and I sincerely hope I'm one of those ordinary people. Most of the renderings we see show three of these inflatable habs attached to the station. Then there is one large, solid module docked at the middle. It's about twice the length of the inflatables. This one is likely the Boeing Science Module. As part of the Orbital Reef team, Boeing is responsible for taking care of the operations and maintenance of the station and providing one dedicated research module. They are also supposed to provide crew transport on the Starliner, but that's a really boring spaceship, so we are leaving it out of our speculative fantasy today. And then we also see two shorter solid modules at either end. I'd guess storage area? There are going to be a lot of people living on the orbital reef simultaneously. It's designed to support 10 crew at a time, and that number will temporarily grow during changeovers. 
The ISS is designed for seven people, and Tiangong has a crew of three, but can support up to six during changeovers. So, the reef crew will need plenty of supplies. Uncrewed Dream Chaser planes will arrive full of Amazon Prime deliveries and Whole Foods' new lineup of dehydrated space meals. Yeah, obviously Bezos is using his own companies to support the station. Amazon Web Service is going to be taking care of the communications and connectivity from orbit as well. Blue Origin will basically serve as the world's first space landlord. They'll rent out the orbital reef to anyone who has the means to get there. It's not going to be cheap, that's for sure. But for certain industries, moving their operations to low Earth orbit could have a massive payoff and a huge competitive advantage. Other people will just go there because they can. This is the real space tourism. Blasting off and then falling back down in Blue Origin's space dildo was just the opening act. Orbital Reef will become the first hotel in orbit. The company promises an optimal, not opulent, experience to life in space. The only questions that remain are, for one, how soon can this actually happen? And two, can Bezos make the economics work? Even for a company with such deep pockets, this is going to be very expensive. The total cost for ISS is something in the neighborhood of $150 billion. The annual cost to keep it going is around $3.5 billion. Blue Origin and Sierra Space are targeting to build their station for between 10 and $15 billion. And considering it's basically the same size as ISS, that would require them to be about 10 times more cost effective than the five space agencies who constructed the ISS across 10 years and 30 launch missions. Now, there is no doubt that a modern space operation can easily beat those numbers. But can they be an order of magnitude more efficient? It costs China between 8 and $9 billion to construct the Tiangong, which is about one-fifth the size of the ISS, giving them a cost efficiency factor of about two and a half times greater than the ISS. Either way, these companies need to make a lot of developments in a very short amount of time if this even has a chance of getting done. So what do you think is going to happen? Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.